So I'm forced to set the stage with a little bit of history because as the Spanish philosopher, poet Jorge Santayana remarked, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, condemned. So let's remember our past for a moment and reacquaint ourselves with why and on what principles this nation was founded. The mothers and fathers of the American Revolution revolted against a tyrant, King George III, whose coercive acts of 1774 drove the colonists into unified opposition. Hmm, a great divider actually becoming a great unifier. The Declaration of Independence of 1776 lists the reasons for needing to break from tyrannical rule and the need to establish independence as united states. The Constitution came into force more than a decade after the suffering under British rule and the great breaking away. There was time for reflection, a word for us to remember, time to figure out exactly how they would express their new nation's purpose in a preamble. How, before getting into the nuts and bolts of daily governance, they would describe the spirit of the supreme law of the land. Before I go any further in setting the stage for tonight's main event of speakers, I invite you to help me in that effort by reciting the preamble with me. And if there is anyone listening who would like to put it to music, uh, I hear there's grumbling for a new national anthem. <laughs> so here is the spirit of our Constitution. Let the words be like poetry written by a bunch of white men who intentionally ignored gender, class, religion. Let us recite the preamble. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, Provide for the common defense. The common defense. Promote, the Promote the general welfare. And secure the blessings of liberty, the blessings of liberty. To, ourselves and our to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this Constitution. Do ordain and establish this Constitution. For the United States of America. Thank you, thank you. So right now, we are here because we live in a time of great upheaval and violence on many levels, both physical and psychological, and we know in our hearts that the old thinking that brought us this time of crisis will not erase what it has created. We are looking for something new to guide us to a more just society, a better world. Like you, I've worked in various ways to try to make it a better world. I've often wondered, however, if my efforts are really dealing with the root cause of the challenges at hand. It was only after I read the visionary work of Dr. Rianne Eisler a year and a half ago that I began to comprehend a bigger picture, the systemic cause of inequality, injustice, and what feels more and more like living under a tyrant king who could give a damn about a radical group of people who wish for liberty and justice for all. Rianne Eisler's visionary work around domination and partnership systems has been a guiding light for 30 years. And my having read her bestseller, The Chalice and the Blade, when I did in March of 2016, prepared me, sort of, for the election results that November. When she and I started working together, she predicted that Trump would win. And she has a pretty solid idea about why 50% of white women voted for a bully. In a nutshell, Rianne believes that humans work together in partnership for at least 30,000 years, and that about 4,000 years ago, profound changes occurred, and that system was replaced by might makes right, the domination system, a system we are all stuck into varying agrees today. In 1776, a valiant effort was made to turn a God-ordained tyrannical rule into a democracy. That effort is alive for us today. We are keepers of it. That's why we're gathered. We know that we are in a crisis. In this country, about 30 years ago, the conservative right began to coalesce around defeating the Equal Rights Amendment, and the culture wars ignited in full force. 
It is Dr. Eisler's contention, and I agree with it, that the domination model began to further define four key cornerstones that underpin any society, economics, gender, narrative, and family. The speakers we have today will be addressing those four cornerstones from their perspectives, from their places in the partnership system. And like our founders, united by a tyrant, we must unite. We won't stop our understandable daily reactive efforts to the daily assaults, but we must unite with an integrated progressive agenda. An agenda, a platform built upon the foundation of partnership, grounded by the four cornerstones that we will repopulate with the principles, the spirit of 1776. First to speak is Laura Flanders, my friend and colleague, progressive journalist, forward thinker, and a really fantastic in-depth interviewer. She is the host of the Laura Flanders Show, Grit TV. Laura will be addressing the cornerstone of narrative. Let's give a big welcome to Laura Flanders. Hi, everybody. I, I want to just give a quick round to Friedrika Merck, who really does know how to partner. I started working in independent media more than 30 years ago. I'll tell you a little bit of my back history, but before that, let me show you a little glimpse of what we do now at the Laura Flanders Show, and I think this will give you an indication of why we do what we do. Too many media outlets turn away the most important stories. I started the Laura Flanders Show because we need a different sort of media. What would our world look like if our news showed us as much collaboration as it does competition? What if we got to meet people making change right here, right now, in all sorts of ways we're usually told are impossible? What does structural racism look like in this country? So much of how we've been socialized to be human is to resist change, to try to create these institutions, to take over everything. People are now beginning to question our entire system. We don't have the state, we don't have the prisons, we don't have the cops, thank God. Um, what we do have is the wild queer feminists of color decolonial imagination. Each week on The Laura Flanders Show, I get to sit down with the smartest thinkers and doers of our time, forward-thinking people you know, and others you'll want to know. I'm interested in what's going wrong and also what's going right. Meet the people and the movements who are pioneering better ways of living in tune with our ecosystem and each other and find out how you can help. Modern capitalist enterprise is the negation of democracy. Climate change changes everything. We are in for dramatic physical change to our world one way or another. We have to see this as a global movement. We can't see our issues as just domestic issues. The Laura Flanders Show also features exclusive investigative reporting. What are the systemic issues that result in a young man being murdered? We want our community to be reinvested in, but we want to be at the table. We want to be decision makers. I knew what Katrina did here was a result of a natural disaster. What I saw out there was a man-made disaster. There's all kinds of amazing prison abolitionist work going on, and divestment is just one part of that. We know! We saw! We watched it all day long! It's one tactic that's a part of a much broader movement. You can't stop the revolution! You can't stop the revolution! And provocative commentary. And I think women are in the forefront of the struggle against sacrifice zones because Women know a thing or two about being sacrificed. The Laura Flanders Show, weekly on Telesaur, Link TV, MNN, and Free Speech TV. Our podcast is available in audio and video at lauraflanders.com. Join us. This year will be the year that we do what we've been waiting for. This year will be the year that we stop knocking and kick down that door. It's going to be ending with us winning, you already know. Thank you. We're in the fight for our lives, in this moment in transitioning our world and in this moment in transforming our media. The only way that we make the change that we need in our world is through making the change that we need in our media. I couldn't believe it more strongly. When I started in journalism 30 years ago, I was about 23 years old and I was in Northern Ireland and I saw somebody killed in front of me um, by, the, by, the, by the cops. And I understood that I had a story that was important to get out. 
I didn't have a contract with any media organization. I had no equipment that I owned. I had no training, no professional expertise. But I knew that this was a story that needed to get out, and I knew of a radio station in New York City that took reports from independent people like myself. So at the end of the day, I called up WBAI, I think on a phone, a long distance phone with a phone card, and I filed my report. So what's changed in 30 years? In 30 years, if a young woman like myself was on the streets of a place like Belfast today, and covering the kind of conflict that was happening in Belfast at the time, she would have a phone, right? She would most likely have the ability to broadcast live to people all across the world the breaking news that she was witness to. The internet, the World Wide Web, has brought us the ability, many people, the ability to make hashtags go viral, make tyrants topple to citizens, report on the abuse by police in communities that have not been covered by our mainstream media for years. It has loosened the control of the gatekeepers, right? No longer is that power in the hands of just a few white men and the corporations that like them. At the same time, though, we faced another kind of challenge. If the internet came with a promise of diversity and democracy and decentralization and, yes, partnership, how did we get to where we are today? Where we've actually seen consolidation of power, domination of narrative, and control. Well, it's not so complicated. What we've seen is a narrative of monopoly meaning making that I think is very critical to what uh, Rihanna is going to talk with us about. You know, again, coming from the UK, you know, we had a reformation against bishops controlling our understanding of God, right? Anyone heard of the reformation? <laughs> we threw out the bishops and we said we can have our own relationship with God, thank you very much. We can read the Bible, we can read it to ourselves, it's not even in Latin anymore. So thinking about that, I think, well, maybe we need a new reformation. Maybe we need a new throwing out of the bishops. Because what's happened in this 30 years is a consolidation of media power that is actually even more grave than what we faced 30 years ago. And I'm willing to have a debate about that. But if you look at what happened in the 1980s, you saw media, the biggest networks, uh, fall into the hands of corporations, Disney, Westinghouse, GE, who wanted to make money, even more money, off our public airwaves, wanted to make money even off the news parts of our airwaves, right? So you saw audiences begin to flee, you saw advertisers begin to flee with the audiences because audiences were fed up. They didn't want to see that many ads, they stopped watching. People turned in, tuned in for half an hour of news, they got 10 minutes of ads. What we saw grow into that vacuum was the internet, with its promise, as I said, of partnership and decentralization. But instead, we saw consolidation of power. And we saw people like the corporation Google, people, corporate people like the corporation Google, see its control of the search engine market go from 35% to 88% in a matter of five years. You saw Amazon's profits go from 6.9 billion to 107 billion in the same sort of time. These are gatekeepers different even from the old ones in the sense that not only do they give us a single version of their version of the news, and don't forget, how do you become a monopoly news media? You have to persuade people that they only need one version of the facts, not the version of the pamphleteers that is the era that Friedrika was talking about, but the version of the evening news, the one newspaper in town, the one source you needed for your news. Hence the myth of objectivity. The dominant story was the only story you needed to read. Well, today we have this illusion of diversity and multiplicity. We have all these websites we can go to, but our news is coming to us through a few very controlled portals. Over 70% of all the audience that goes to any news site goes through Facebook. Think about that. Over 70% of all the access, all the eyeballs that go to any news site goes through one outlet that is not run by journalists, is not run by editors or anybody with any experience covering or considering the news. We now, not just, we, we now don't just have a television channel that we can tune in and tune off. 
but we have media in our pockets that is engaging us in a discourse that young people who use Snapchat, for example, are checking 150 times a day. They're not just one way communicating information, they are being extracted. We talk about, you know, the, the corporations that own our media have often been extractive industries, oil companies and so on. Well, companies like Google and Facebook are themselves extractive. They are taking our data, our information, they are communicating back to us what they think will serve their advertisers and their underwriters. So again, when it comes to domination, I used to complain about the dominant narrative being a narrative that required one hero and one enemy and began on a certain date and ended at a certain date. And was that the day that the people took up arms to free themselves or was it the day that people were occupied by an occupying force? Who sets the clock? Who decides who's good and bad? And why does our narrative always have to be a narrative of win or lose? What about the process? What about the people? That was bad enough. Now we have both a narrative like that and the ability to control people's access to information so that they only feed, they only receive what feeds their preconceived ideas. Right now you have the algorithms that Facebook and Google have instituted to fight fake news, actually catching websites like mine and websites like The Nation magazine and Alternet and alternative progressive outlets because they seem opinionated. Alternet has seen its audience go, drop by 40% since the new algorithms came into effect at Google and Facebook. So we have a real challenge. We cannot have a public democracy or civil society without a public media infrastructure and civil media, civil journalism. Journalism that is civic-minded, that is driven by, connect, by the interest of connecting people, not driving them apart. We're in the fight of our lives. The answer, I believe, is to this challenge of our democracy right now goes right through media and journalism. We can't create a pathway or the pathway to the sort of civil society that we want goes through civil media, civil society media. And that's what I'm dedicated to bringing our audiences every week. There are stories that run counter to the stories that drive us apart. There are stories today on the show, for example, of people in Detroit figuring out how to serve their communities with internet service that they, the people, control. There are stories right now of people who are bringing help to people in Puerto Rico, help that will enable them to save the ecosystem of Puerto Rico before Monsanto gets in there and privatizes the grain. They're sending seeds um, to fa family farmers that have sustained the biggest hit they've ever felt um, with, the, with the disasters that have hit. We can tell these stories that are different, and we can be journalists like Ida Tarbell, who, take down the mono who took down the monopoly of her, of her time, or Ida B. Wells, who told the story of lynching even when the KKK were out for her life. We have a history in this country of journalists taking on power and bursting the dominant narrative with an entirely different narrative of what's going on. We can do it again. I believe we are doing it again. And we'll do it again with your help and the help of the work of people like Rianne Eisler. I want to thank you all for being here. And I will join you in the Q&A. Terrific, terrific, terrific work. Uh, our next speaker is Jamia Wilson, really dynamic new executive director of the Feminist Press. She's a feminist activist, writer, much sought after commentator on the national and regional levels. I'm delighted she could join us today to address the cornerstone of gender. Let's give a big welcome to Jamia Wilson. Thank you so much for having me. And also, I just want to thank Lara, who is one of the first people to give me voice in media to be able to speak. And I want to say that that's about collaboration and interdependence, because I wouldn't have been able to grow in my media making and work if people like Lara didn't give voice to young, hungry activists um, who just moved to New York far before I was working at the feminist press. So. 
when I joined the feminist press, my board was really excited about honoring Dr. Eisler. And they told me about her work and her book, specifically The Chalice and the Blade. And I decided I needed to find out about this book because everyone was so thrilled about it and that it had moved them and shifted their thinking. And when I did read it, I learned that the call for partnership systems was really an antidote to systems of domination and oppression. And that really resonated with what my heart and spirit's always been yearning for, but specifically in this political and cultural moment, and I don't have to tell you why, uh, because what I really believe that my place in the movement for gender justice is about is about promoting righteous solidarity as resistance. So although there are many facets of how I could go about speaking to gender and how it relates to the model that Dr. Eisler wrote about in her books and the partnership systems model, I want to specifically talk about the body and explore the body as a place where systems of domination try to exert power, power over versus power with, through violence, through fear, through shame, through blame, and through stigma. As Dr. Eisler notes, the Trump administration continues to promote strong men and strong state violence against those who are excluded from its narrative. This is immigrants, refugees, undocumented persons, people of color, and especially women, and our reproductive rights, transgender individuals, and the LGBTQ community, disabled people, and many more. Her framework recognizes that untangling one injustice involves working to transform many other kinds. We're all inextricably connected to each other's liberation. And it's important to understand that this violence is intersectional. The issues of gender, race, and class are all intertwined and experienced differently depending on our positioning and proximity to privileged identities within our culture. And to better append any manifestation of this violence, we must consider these issues together and advocate for social justice where none of us are left behind. So let's consider for a moment some of the most pressing issues that oppressed and marginalized groups face today. Police brutality and mass incarceration are major issues that impact me as a black woman, but also as an American. Barriers to caregiving access for our most vulnerable community members, including our children and our elders, and wage inequality and inaccessibility to gatekeepers. These are just a few to name. Think of how many people, particularly women, who have stories told and untold about their experiences with these issues. Just this week, in the aftermath of the revelations about Harvey Weinstein and his long track record of sexual harassment and abuse, we've seen social media flooded with hashtag Me Too stories and testimony about women and non-binary people's experiences with sexual harassment and assault. These exemplify the values of partnership systems because they encourage empathy, they encourage action, and encourage community. And that's why, to put these into context, I just want to tell you a few personal stories. Because to quote Marielle Rukeyser, who we have also had the pleasure and privilege of being able to print at the Feminist Press, what would happen if one woman were to tell the truth about her life? The world would split right open. So I'd like to briefly share the stories of my mother's experiences with racial and sexual violence, as well as the story of my cousin, Joanne Little. I grew up in this southern family that was full of deep love, but also deep suffering. And growing up, I learned early on that women's bodies specifically were battlegrounds, that black women's bodies and being a black woman would come with deep, deep pain that I was told about at an early age. My parents set me down and my dad said, not only are you black, but you're a woman and you're smart too and you're not afraid to speak your mind, your life is gonna be rough. And while putting that in context, I learned about how my mother was one of 200 students who protested against segregation in her college community in 1968 in a town called Orangeburg. And two of my mom's friends were killed along with a 16-year-old high school student simply because they wanted to integrate a bowling alley. That was the first time that law enforcement was at fault for a mass shooting at a college campus. 
but most people don't know about that like they know about Kent State. Just over the weekend, I went with my mom, who's a very, very stoic woman. I think I've seen her cry three times in my life, and one of them was when her wisdom teeth was taken out, so it was involuntary. We went together to the site of this violence, and my mother, who's, again, unflappable in that Maxine Waters kind of way that I love, was weeping and just got choked up for a minute and said, those were my friends. And she started talking about how one of them sat behind her in the classroom and another one in his sweet manner would always ask her how her day had been. And she said, as the police shot at us indiscriminately, it could have been me, but it wasn't, but it was them. It could have been me. And she went on to tell me about how in sit-ins and other actions that they were doing, that she continued to endure pain. And she continued to show up because she had seen her friends die for fighting for their rights. But in her experience, she saw that law enforcement would focus on kicking her and her female counterparts in their reproductive regions. She continues to suffer from health issues today that were perpetuated from that violence. And so when I think about the interconnectedness of these struggles in gender, I think about how the strong men, as Dr. Eisler said, really understood that in order to weaken a community, to attack it, to threaten it in its very sustainability and its ability to thrive, that focusing on targeting women, their reproductive systems, and also sparking the patriarchal ire of the men in that community were a part of that nefarious plan, and it continues today. The next story I wanna share is the story of my cousin, Joanne Little, whose story also taught me about gender justice for my family and racial justice and its connection. My cousin was jailed for a petty crime, shoplifting, and the reason she was shoplifting was because she wasn't getting the support she needed in the community because of all the systemic inequities that we're talking about today. And while she was in prison, the white jailer who incarcerated her in the early 70s attempted to rape her. And my cousin took the ice pick that he used to threaten her turned it on him and used deadly force to save her own life. And when she did that, she escaped because she lived in 1970s North Carolina and knew what was going to happen, which was that our state called for her to die by gas chamber through the death penalty, simply for standing up for her own human rights and dignity. But then when she escaped and other people in the community came together, people gave her safe houses, they supported her and rallied around her and built a partnership-based collaborative coalition. She decided that she was going to put her life in the hands of the court, as she said. And she decided that she was going to put herself out there in the spirit of partnership and independence, interdependence so that if she were to win that case, she would be able to change the law so that any person who was incarcerated would be able to defend themselves in the face of violence. And because people came together from different groups, because this issue struck the heart chords of so many people who understood that were inextricably connected, from the ACLU to now, to prison abolition groups, to labor rights groups, she still lives today and was acquitted. And now, because of her, legislation changed for people today who can actually go to that legislation and say that yes, it is my right, although I'm incarcerated, to have the right to defend myself if my life is threatened. And so I share those familial stories to say that it's really important for us to make those connections because through those stories of incarceration, racial violence, class-based violence, through these stories of subjugation and harm and strongman violence, I learned that gender justice or feminism were just as important to my life as a human being as racial justice and economic equality for all people. And this is why I truly believe that we need to apply those same principles to righteous solidarity and resistance as we move forward as a community. The last thing I'll say is that we seriously need to look back on what our ancestors have built because they've done this coalition work before. And Dr. Eisler talks about how that was done before we've become a part of this historical moment. But I want to say that what happened with my cousin happened in 1975 when they won that case. 
and that's because people came together and saw a common ground. When I was at the Women's March, I had a moment where I felt like we were almost there again. And I saw a lot of different people who were coming together across difference to organize. But then when a white woman put her hands on me and pushed me out of her way and physically used force to knock me over, it reminded me that we still have a lot of work to do to realize that we're all connected in order to build together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Fantastic, fantastic. Our next speaker is Tony McAleer. He is the executive director of Life After Hate, one of the organizations whose grant money was awarded by the Obama administration and rescinded by the domination, I mean, <laughs> the, the Donald Trump's administration. Tony is a former organizer of the white Aryan resistance and served as a skinhead recruiter. His personal transformation, inspired by love, has brought him here today to speak about the cornerstone of family. Let's give a big welcome to Tony. So I bet you're all wondering, how did a middle class white kid end up in the white Aryan resistance? Well, more importantly, how did somebody from the white Aryan resistance end up here in front of you tonight speaking from the Lincoln Lecter? We have to go back to the beginning in family. Everybody here at some point had a family, came from a family? Yes. Thought so. So I came into the world, I'll, I'll give you a tip. How does someone become a neo-Nazi? They're not born that way, right? They come into the world and, and life happens to them. And when I go back and I think of who was little Tony at the age of four? This bright, curious, sensitive, mischievous, stubborn, defiant, um, and sensitive. Growing up in a family and then going to a school where it wasn't safe to be that. My father uh, loved us very much. He was a great provider. That was his way of showing his love. But he worked 80 hours a week and I never really saw him. And I craved to spend attention and time with him. And at the age of 10, I walked in on him with another woman. And that's when the God fell off the pedestal. Does anybody here remember a time in their life where the God fell off the pedestal? I think we all have that experience. And it left me very angry, very confused, and very mistrusting of uh, authority figures. And I went from a straight-A student down to a C student the next year. And <clears throat> school got together with my parents. And the school was an extension, really, of my family. And they decided that they would beat the grades into me. So if I didn't get an A or a B, on major tests or assignment, I was to be caned. Not, I remember getting the test, looking at it like Texas Hold'em, looking, oh, 72, I know what that meant. And I got marched down to the office, and I'd have to bend over his desk. Has anyone heard this one? This is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you? Yeah, I thought so. To be in that place where you know something bad is really going to happen, and there's nothing you can do about it? And I had to bend over that desk as he hit me on the rear end with a yardstick. He stopped at eight always, but that happened over and over and over again. And I remember, even to this day, I don't think that I've ever felt more powerless than I did in that office over and over and over again. I ended up having to, to leave that school and, and take those experiences and what did I do with them? You know, there's an old saying that goes, what we don't transform, we transmit. And I took that domination and the shame that it created, and I went out into the world. And I chose to do it to other people. I became a skinhead. I embraced ideologies of domination because when the product of domination is shame. And we are, when we are living from a place of shame, we want to react to that and dominate. It's an endless cycle. And I can remember when I was about 17, and it was one of the things that I'm, I'm really ashamed of that I did, and I participated in a gay bashing. 
And we chased this young gay man into a crawl space in a construction site. And he went underneath into the darkness. And we couldn't get after him. We knew we could hear him scurrying in the darkness, couldn't see him. And like kids at the lake, we picked up stones and whistled them into the darkness. Like skipping stones across the lake. Clack, clack, clack. Clack, clack, clack. And every third or fourth one, you said, ah, so the guy man yelled out in pain. There he was, knowing that something really bad was going to happen. There's nothing he could do about it. There he was, knowing he was completely powerless in that moment. And what I'm most ashamed of is I knew that feeling too. Yet I wanted to put it on another person. I should have known better. I should have had compassion and empathy for that man. But I couldn't. I didn't see that. I wanted to project it out onto the world. Then when I was about 23, into my hands, in the delivery room of a hospital, comes my little baby daughter. And I'm holding her. She hasn't opened her eyes yet. She's got a little scrunchy face like this. And she opens her eyes. And my face is the first picture her brain's going to take. And I connected with another human being for the first time since I could remember when. I had shut down. To be in that place that I was at, I was completely shut down from my heart. It was too painful. You know, we would come into this world open, and we shut down because it's not safe to stay open. But I couldn't help to open up in front of that. And I had a son 15 months later, and I got to parent him the way that I always wanted to be parented, which was the opposite of domination and these children the way they responded to that was it's safe to love a child they give us unconditional love and compassion it's safe to love a child they're not capable of shaming they're not capable of ridicule they're not capable of any of those things at least not till about 13 and then that's all they want to do but in that safe safe place I allowed my heart to open and to thaw. And, and what those children gave me in that gift, and, and, you know, it's the gift within partnership, you know, empathy and compassion. You know, when we're compassionate with someone, you know what we do to them? We hold up a mirror, and through our compassion, we allow that person to see their own humanity reflected back at them. They were my mirror to my own humanity that I couldn't see when I looked in the mirror. It was incredibly powerful experience and, and gift that, that they gave me. And I think when we go out into the world, um, this is what I truly believe, you know, coming from a place where I had dehumanized other human beings, the level at which we dehumanize other human beings is a, reflected, a reflection of how internally disconnected and dehumanized we are. And I think that until we go and look and correct that disconnection and dehumanization within ourselves, as long as we're dehumanizing anybody for any reason, we can never have peace. And so the mission of Life After Hate is to inspire people to a place of compassion and forgiveness for themselves and for all people. We have compassion for everybody else, but not ourselves. That's about ego. If we have compassion for ourselves and nobody else, that's narcissism. And we need to get that in balance. And the hardest thing for someone like me has been to forgive myself. Because I did horrible things to people who didn't deserve it. And I spewed all kinds of poison into the world to people who didn't deserve it. I made people feel unsafe to people who didn't deserve it. And it sounds self-serving to get to that place of compassion and forgiveness for the self. It's self-serving. Good for you, Tony. You know, I'm glad you've been able to sort that out for yourself. But the more I engage and have compassion and forgiveness for myself, the more I diminish my capacity to do harm in the world. And those with a powerful 
lessons that I learned in the gift that my children gave me around family. Because I came from a domination family. That domination family gave me shame. I turned around, took that shame, and projected it as domination into the world. And then not until we step out of it, recognize it, and break the cycle. When I got to parent my son the way I always wanted to be parented, it was incredibly cathartic and healing. It broke the cycle. Broke the cycle and allowed my relationships to begin from a place of partnership and not from a place of domination. Thank you very much. so much. Our final speaker is someone whom I think of as a light on the porch. This is an old expression. During a terrible blizzard, my grandfather got lost in the woods of Vermont, and his sister stood for hours on the porch of their home, slowly moving a lantern back and forth until my grandfather almost dropping from exhaustion, saw the light on the porch. Rhianne Eisler is my light on the porch. Because of her work, I understand my own experience with the domination system, and it has clarified my political work as well. Actually, I think Rhianne has been waving her lantern for all of us for decades. Perhaps we're now ready to look at her and look her way. This former systems scientist for the Rand Corporation, author of numerous books and scholarly publications, has figured out something profound, I believe life-changing. And with that light, she also offers us a new lens to look through, offers new thinking to consider, to reflect upon, as we make our way to a more unified country through partnership, through an integrated progressive agenda. We're going to see a video first, and that will lead us to Rianne Eisler. I was born in Europe, in Vienna, at a time well, of massive social regression to what I call a domination system. It was the rise to power of the Nazis, first in Germany and then in my native Austria. So from one day to the next, my whole world collapsed and my parents and I, we became hunted with license to kill. My father was the most powerful figure in my life. On crystal night, I saw how he was pushed down the stairs by a gang of Gestapo men. That was very hard. And it was only by a hair's breadth. We were actually um, one of the last ships to Cuba, uh, before one that was turned back to St. Louis. That ship was not permitted to land anywhere. It had to go back to Europe. And of course, many of the people on board were murdered by the Nazis, as happened to most of my family, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins. Growing up that way and witnessing and experiencing what I did led me to questions questions that most of us have asked about whether it has to be this way. When we humans have such an enormous capacity for caring, why has there been so much insensitivity, so much cruelty, so much destructiveness? So when I set out on my research, I actually drew from a much larger database than most studies. And I began to see patterns, configurations historically and cross-culturally that are not visible using these very fragmenting lenses. 
such as right or left, religious or secular, Eastern or Western, capitalist or socialist, and so on, particularly revisiting the story of our cultural origins, a fascinating picture began to emerge. It's nice to see you for a little bit, at least. First of all, I, I want to thank Friedrike for introducing me for, and my work, uh, and for all you do and have done, Friedrike, including now as empresaria of this event, for which I think we should give her a big hand. It is a great pleasure for me to be with you tonight. And I want to start really where the short video that you just saw ended, with the patterns that my research identified, the configurations of the domination system and the partnership system as two underlying social categories, social configurations that make it possible for us to connect the dots, configurations that transcend conventional categories such as right versus left, religious versus secular, Eastern versus Western, and so forth. So I'm asking you really to step out of your comfort zones because we're also used to these categories and consider, well, what happened to me? I could not answer the questions that came out of my early childhood experiences uh, using the lenses of these conventional categories. I mean, to begin with, societies in every one of these categories have been violent, repressive, unjust. Moreover, and this is really critical, if you really think about it, none of these categories pay attention to the situation of the majority of humanity, women and children. And therefore, they all ignore also the findings that we have from psychology and now also from neuroscience, that what children observe, what children experience in their families and other early environments affects nothing less than how our brains develop. In other words, it affects how people feel, think, and act, including how they vote, and I'll get to that. Now, by contrast, because I want to really sort of give you a bit of the larger picture before I get to the fourth cornerstone of economics, the categories of partnership and domination systems take all of this into account. And it's only when we use these new lenses that we can see the four cornerstones that we're talking about this evening. Family and childhood, gender, economics, and narratives, and language and how different, how very different these are depending on the degree to which a society orients to either end of the partnership domination social scale. So just to give you some examples, whether it's a secular rightist regime like Hitler's Nazi Germany or a secular leftist regime like Kim Jong-un's North Korea, whether it's religious regimes like ISIS or uh, the Taliban or, the, or Iran or would-be theocracies like the Rightist Fundamentalist Alliance right here in the United States. If you look for these four cornerstones, what you see is, first of all, their ideal norm is consistency 
one of domination, family, and cultural relations. Of course, that then translates into domination in the state or tribe. I mean, we have to begin to connect the dots. Domination, gender relations, and with this, something very, very important that we really have to start paying attention to, which is a gendered system of values in which everything that is stereotypically considered feminine, whether in a woman or a man, caregiving, nonviolence, is devalued. Dominator economies, uh, whether it's top-down control of resources by feudal lords, by kings, by shahs, by emirs, by emperors, or by mega corporations. And then, yes, the fourth cornerstone, narratives and language that present all of this as inevitable and even moral. Now, these are the cornerstones that regressives in the United States have for decades focus enormous resources and energy on. And I've really studied this. They not only appropriated family, values, and morality, and demonized gender partnership, but they have also promoted top-down economic control, trickle-down economics. Yes, and narratives. Some of you remember narrative that still rings in my head, which is that what's good for General Motors, a mega corporation, is somehow good for us all. Now, these are the cornerstones that they have understood. They've had an integrated, regressive political agenda focused on these four cornerstones, when by contrast, and this has really been our tragedy, most progressives have not focused on building these foundations for a more just and caring partnership system, and we must. That's what this is about. Now, the prior panelists have eloquently discussed the first three cornerstones, and I want to briefly talk about the fourth cornerstone, economics. And I am not going to talk with you about economics from the conventional perspective. Again, here, I'm asking you to step out of your comfort zones of capitalism versus socialism or socialism versus capitalism. Because, frankly, well, to begin with, both these systems came out of the 1700s and the 1800s, early industrial times. And we are now in the 21st century post-industrial age. So on that count alone, they would be antiquated. But there's much more to that, because they also came out of times that oriented much more closely still to the domination side of the continuum. If you really look at it, it was a time when authoritarian regimes of kings, emperors, sheiks, and so on ruled in states and tribes, and yes, men. Men ruled over women and children because these Enlightenment philosophers, like Locke, for example, yeah, everything applied to relations between men and men, but when it came to the relations of men with women and children, uh-uh. So that even in the United States, in most states at the time, that capitalism and then socialism emerged, women and their work were by law and custom the property of their husbands. We should be teaching that in our schools because people need to understand what we really are trying to emerge from, which is this integrated domination system. Well, obviously, all of this was very bad for women, but it was also bad for men and children of both genders. Because, as I said, with the subordination and devaluation of women comes a gendered system of values that, as I said, we've really got to pay attention to. And because we've inherited this, in which these traits and activities 
that are stereotypically, because this has nothing to do with anything inherent in women and men, stereotypically associated with women, such as caring, caregiving, nonviolence, are simply not considered keeping a clean home environment. You know, that was just women's work. So for both Smith and Marx, nature was there to be exploited. Not a word about caring for nature. And for both of them, the women's work, quote unquote, of caring for people starting in early childhood just wasn't part of their, what they considered, quote, productive work. And of course, as long as caring, I mean, these are systems dynamics we need to understand. As long as caring is so culturally devalued, we cannot realistically expect caring social and economic policies, including policies that no longer damage our natural environment. Now, the basic problem, and I write about that in my book, The Real Wealth of Nations, is that both capitalism and socialism fail to include critical parts of what is really the economy. They only include the market, government, and to some extent, the illegal economy. But they fail to include the three life-sustaining sectors, natural economy, the volunteer economy, and the household economy. Now, this is why we so need a new economic system that really starts with a fully integrated economic map. Because once we do, what we begin to see is not only that this is essential for a more sustainable and a more just economy of society, but it's essential also to meet the unprecedented challenges of our new technological age when automation, robotics, artificial intelligence have already taken over so many existing jobs and are predicted, as many of you know, to continue to do so at an exponentially rapid pace. Now, this massive technological dislocation, as we see all around us, is a crisis. But it is also an opportunity it's the opportunity to redefine what is and is not productive work. At a time when economists themselves, who are still very tunnel visioned, really, in this old economic map, but they do keep telling us that the most important thing for the post-industrial economy is what they like to call high-quality human capital. And again, we know from neuroscience that whether this, quote, high quality human capital is developed or is not developed, largely hinges on the quality of care and education children receive early on. Now, the devaluation of the work of care is reflected and perpetuated by current economic measurements, such as gross domestic product and gross national product, which are all based on the old economic map. And they're very bizarre measures because consider that they actually include activities that take and harm life. Making cigarettes, great for GDP. Selling those and then the medical bills and the funeral bills, fantastic for GDP. Oil spills, great for GDP. You know, the cleanup costs, the lawsuits, etc. So <laughs> really, this makes no sense. I mean, for example, an old stand of trees is only included once it's chopped down. That's when it gets into GDP. Never mind that we can't breathe without having trees. And of course, it fails to include not only that, but it fails to include the hard work of people who care for children, the sick, the elderly, and others at home, even though 
Studies show that if its value were included, it would constitute 30 to 50 percent of the reported GDP. I mean, that's huge, but I bet you you've never heard of that. Well, we've got to really make that information available to people. Well, so a first step is to change how we measure economic health. And the Center for Partnership Studies, our Caring Economy campaign, has done just that. We developed what we called social wealth economic indicators. And you can find out more about them at caringeconomy.org, including that our wealthy United States is the only developed nation with no national funding for paid parental leave, invests the least in early childhood care and education, and less than half as much in family benefits as other OECD nations, and invests only about one-third as much on environmental protection. So, not coincidentally, yes, as these metrics also reveal, because it not only looks at where we are, but at what kind of investments or lack of investments where we are correlates with that, our nation's child poverty rate is nearly twice the OECD average. We have the highest infant mortality rate of all major developed nations. We have a huge maternal mortality rate, and we have the lowest enrollment rates in early childhood education. Now, obviously, all of this is horrible in human terms, but it's also really horrible in strictly economic terms. Once we leave behind these old ways of thinking about economics, because consider what this says about the failure of our nation to invest in human capacity development that is so essential in our post-industrial era, since we know from neuroscience that 85% of our brain architecture is formed in our very early years. So, Changing, by the way, the devaluation of care work is also essential to cut through seemingly intractable cycles of poverty. Worldwide, and again, you probably don't even know this, most people don't, worldwide women are the mass of the poor and the poorest of the poor. Even in these wealthy United States, according to the US Census, women over the age of 65 are twice as likely to live in poverty as men of the same age. And it's not only through what we hear about, thank goodness, which is job discrimination, but it's that most of these women are or were either full or part-time caregivers. And as I said, we today know how valuable this work is, that it really, you know, household work, which is mostly care work, is shown by statistical studies to really, if it were included, it would be 30 to 50 percent of the reported GDP. So, of course, now, you know, a lot of people are going to tell you, including many of our government people, well, supporting caring for people is just not economically feasible. But actually, and again, this is something the caring economy campaign highlights, it is extremely profitable. And I want to end with that. I want to end with an example, a real life example, of nations such as Sweden and Finland that pioneered caring policies. Nations that in the early 20th century were so poor that there were famines and today are regularly in the highest ranks of the World Economic Forum's global competitiveness reports because a major factor in that was that they did invest in caring for people starting in early childhood. But, and this is really where we come right back to these four cornerstones, because none of this was coincidental. It happened because these nations moved 
toward the partnership side of the partnership domination scale. And you can see that if you look at them in terms of the four cornerstones we've been discussing. First, family and childhood. In addition to generous paid parental leave for both mothers and fathers, and that's very important, stipends to help families raise children, elder care with dignity, universal health care, good quality child care and other caring policies, they actually also pioneered very progressive legislation such as laws that say that it's against the law to use violence, to use, quote, physical discipline against children in families, which translates, yes, because it's interconnected, into the more peaceful character of these nations. Second, gender. You know, there is more gender equity in these nations, and not perfect, but they have the lowest gender gap, according to the World Economic Forum's gender gap reports, of any nation, but there is more gender equality in both the family and the state. Women are about half the national legislature. And you know, we can't really seriously talk about representative democracy if we really don't address that as people like Jamia and so many others are working toward, to change this. And they also are, have a very different definition of masculinity. You know, something that Tony so eloquently really talked about here, because they, as the status of women rises, and this is really interesting, it wasn't just women who voted for more caring policies in these nations, men did too, because as the status of women rises, men no longer feel it's such a threat to their, quote, identity, their, quote, masculinity, if they too embrace more stereotypically feminine caring values. Economics, as you saw, they have a more caring economics, which also includes caring more effectively for nature. And fourth, narratives, Laura spoke about this, they're different. What they consider moral, what they consider right, is different from the narratives in domination systems, and so is language. You know, they often call themselves not social democracies, which, by the way, was a term Hitler also used. They call themselves very often caring societies. So there is much more I'd like to share with you, but I have to close. So I want to invite you. Well, in doing this thing that we hear so much about in recent years, that has almost become a cliche, of thinking outside the box. And yes, putting this new thinking into action by joining with us to build these four cornerstones, partnership family and childhood relations, partnership gender relations, a new economic system that is embedded, of course, in the principles of partnership rather than domination, a caring economy. And I know that people do a double take, you know, when you put caring and economy in the same sentence, but just think, isn't that a terrible comment on how we've been conditioned to accept that uncaring values should drive our economic systems? It doesn't have to be that way. And of course, that takes me to narratives and language. In other words, these four cornerstones, we've got to build them. Regressives have paid so much attention to them. We progressives must because otherwise we will not have the foundations for that more equitable, sustainable, and caring world we so want and need for ourselves, our children, and generations to come. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.